Although Alexander Shulgin is not exactly a household name, he is unquestionably the most important psychedelic chemist who has ever lived. Those who do know of him are usually only familiar with his role in the rediscovery and popularization of MDMA. But MDMA is just one of 100 plus unique chemicals that compose Shulgin's pharmacopoeia, which extends so far into the unknown that he's often had to invent new terms to describe the effects. Iromp is one of my favorites. The drugs are also some of the most valuable medicines known to man, and although only a fraction of them have been formally studied, they are the best tools we have for understanding the chemical composition of the human mind. We are about to go to Alexander and Ann Shulgin's house, and I am insanely excited. It was a very strange set of circumstances that allowed him to synthesize all of these drugs, and in today's legal climate, there's no way anyone could have done this. So there, there can never be another Alexander Shulgin. He's been tripping almost on a weekly basis for the last 60 years. Pretty much every psychedelic drug known came out of this house, and he lives right there. After years of preparation, I called the Shulgin residence, ostensibly for an interview. The call was answered by Anne, Alexander Shulgin's wife. She reminded me that he does not really give interviews anymore, and if my meeting with him were to turn into one, it would be his last. I was elated. I love Alexander Shulgin. He is my idol, my hero, my son, my O2. I love each of the 978 pages of his phenethylamine magnum opus, P-Call phenethylamines I have known and loved, and every milligram of his 1.13 kilogram tryptamine treatise, T-Call, tryptamines I have known and loved. He's the grandfather of ecstasy, the molecular magician, the atomic conquistador. He's more of a mythological creature, a centaur of chemistry, than he is a real person, but he does exist, as I'm about to attest. The plant. Have you discovered any new alkaloids recently in them? What have we discovered recently? Well, we haven't discovered any anything new. We're just looking at different uh, different potencies of the various uh, species. I see. Okay. It's interesting. And I tell you, nothing is more confusing, contradictory, and ambiguous than what species of cactus might be. What was the one? It was the um, Lubivia. 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 You ever heard of the cactus Lubivia? No. Lubivia grandiflorus. That was, I think, the name of it. And then someone else said, oh, that, that's, a, that's a good cactus. But it's not a cactus Lubivia. It, actually, it's a Trichocerus. We we'll call it Trichocerus grandiflorus. Then another botanist came up and said, wanted to work with it, and said, well, that's not a Trichocerus. That, that's a Trichocerus Lubivioides is what it should be called. Now they're trying to get a genus out of... of uh, uh, and they also called it Echinoceros. Yeah, uh, right. Oh, From there on, our conversation wound through similar territory. We spoke mostly in riddles, including, but not limited to, numerical palindromes, hyphenated palindromes, or lack thereof, SI units of mass with an emphasis on the femtogram, words that begin with the letter X, and words that begin with the sound X, the correct pluralization of the word fungus, of which there are three variations and four pronunciations, and an analysis of the peach pie I brought as a hypothetical new psychedelic drug, 5-methoxy peach pie. If you had a brand new compound, here, right that one, right there. Yes. Brand new. Yes. <laughs> Never been made before, not the literature. Yes. But you damn that bet that's going to be psychedelic. It just has the right feel of structure for it to be psychedelic. Yeah. Uh, but it's never been made. Uh, how much would you start with? Uh, well, give me an example of a new drug. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, let's have an example of uh, uh, five methoxy uh, N uh, uh, isopropyl N allyl uh, tripping. Okay. Well, let me think. I would start. Just for example. <laughs> for example. <laughs> well, just to be very, I would imagine that would not be active under one milligram, probably. So it's start with. But do you think it? Do you think it could be? Do you think it well, could be? I don't know. <laughs> I've not tried it. <laughs> I would start at one milligram personally. And I took. And what if it turned out to be LSD? Then I would be in for a. Yeah, trip. Then, then, <laughs> what LSD before I first tried? How much would it start? Would you start with it if it had never been tried before? There's no way of saying where to start. There's no way, okay. <laughs> so if you think this is where I would start, 
go to one thousandth of that start down there. You're not using much more compound. Right, of course. Yeah. And then if nothing happens at the end of the day, maybe another another nanogram. Nothing there, wait wait a week, then take three nanograms. Then take five nanograms and work it up over a period of time but you work up 75 compounds all different days different compounds they will bang this this is showing you some activity but you don't know what it's going to be you have no way of guessing a brand new compound you have no way of guessing are you still there you want to go over to the lab sure okay one water waddle our way over Before we left, Anne brought out a large frosty pitcher of strawberry lemonade. I had to remind myself that this was Anne Shulgin, the woman who pioneered the practice of MDMA psychotherapy, who in this very house, perhaps in this room, used MDMA and 2CB to treat everything from nitrous oxide addiction to demonic possession, often with patients finding themselves cured in ways that years of conventional talk therapy could have only begun to remedy. I hope you don't mind my using my bare hands, Anne said, as she dropped additional ice cubes into my glass. Not at all, I said. I wouldn't have minded if the ice cubes were dropped into my cup with her bare feet. The cactus look healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys get out of more sun though. They're getting a little bit sun deprived. Ho, ho, ho! So this is Sasha Shulgin's lab book. This is from the 1960s. This, this is from the latter 1960s. The opening date is uh, 1967. But that's probably about five years worth of notes. It's kind of a treasure trove of uh, you know, probably one of Sasha's most productive periods in the laboratory. And that would have all been done uh, right here in this in this space. Yes. We, fig we figured that you, you started work here maybe around 1964, 1964. Something this, okay. And uh, you, had, you had ended off with Dow around 1963. No, actually I left them in, I think it was 1957 or 67, probably 67. Where you finally, finally, finally ended. They ended. They, they were getting increasingly unhappy with the fact that I was working on what they told me to work on and they knew whatever interested me. Uh. And that turned out to be psychedelic drugs and they didn't particularly want to go commercially that way. Shulgin's career started at the Dow Chemical Company, where he made a name for himself synthesizing Zectran, the first biodegradable insecticide. After this success, he was given freedom to work on chemicals of his choosing. He chose psychedelics and went on to create an amphetamine called DOM, which at the time was second only to LSD in potency. A single large dose could last a solid 48 hours. In 1967, Brooklynite chemist Nick Sand realized the drug's market potential. He built an industrial laboratory in San Francisco where he cooked DOM in a 150-gallon soup vessel and sold it by the kilo to the Hells Angels, who rode across America unleashing tens of thousands of excessively potent 20 milligram DOM tablets on the public. The influx caused hordes of hippies to freak out at the Golden Gate Park human be in. Eventually, it was realized that DOM was the product of legitimate pharmaceutical research conducted by a then-unknown chemist at Dow. Unsurprisingly, this made Dow very unhappy. Once the source was identified, Shulkin's ties to the company were severed. I said, well, if you can look at structures and make that kind of a, of a guesswork, why don't you work on whatever you want to work with, and we'll just try them out. I said, well, I'm interested in psychedelics, I'll make psychedelics. And pretty soon they kind of discouraged me from going on that way. So I, what I did, I began publishing from my home address, and they got more unhappy with that, and so I finally left them. That was it. Went back to uh, college and med school and had a lot of fun there. <laughs> Free from Dow, Shulgin set up a personal laboratory in his backyard and began researching drugs with complete independence. Over the course of 50 years, he completed the most exhaustive examination of psychedelic structures ever accomplished. 
and manufactured an array of drugs that rivals the output of many large pharmaceutical companies. You're looking at labels. Uh, these are just labels? <laughs> <laughs> these are the new creations? Those are uh, uh, a workup. Uh, whenever you start one of these things, you know, you do a reaction and you've got what you wanted plus probably some of what you started with and like something else you have no idea what it is <laughs> so we're in the process of just working up that, that particular reaction <laughs> apparently for hydroxy dalt was tested and found to be very weak it required something like a hundred milligrams mm -hmm. to produce an effect that's interesting i'm not aware of that report no, i'm not aware of that either yeah it could have been impure, it could have been something else, who knows. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was coming most likely from a Chinese laboratory. Do these laboratories ever consult you? Do they ever email you? And uh, Because it seems as if they exclusively work they on do, your they, creation. Yeah, but they, they do their own thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, because you, you, you have just a tremendous influence on the... On the drug market, whether you whether yeah, you I think what it, it is a big influence in the drug market is they out there are making piles of money out of it too. Oh yes, of course. And that's one thing I avoid entirely. Of course, I just avoid the, any fun. Go to something else because I do not want to be in any receiving aspect of, of the financial part. Yes, well, that's good. But these people never consult you and say. Uh, and say, will you recommend, you know, No, 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 that's not, that's not, not why. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. They just keep, keep around and see what, what comes next to the literature. Well, tell them the story of uh, the 5-methoxy galt. That's the one that uh, uh, Merple had on his website. Oh, that's right, Mer Merple did that. Uh, yeah, he, I, I gave him, a, it was about a page. Mm -hmm. uh, the brochure of how it was made, one thing, and then he put it on his website. And he took it off the website. I think I mentioned this earlier. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And took it off, but it was in the public domain within three weeks. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. A bit of background on that statement. On May 24th, 2004, Shulgin sent an email to a psychonaut named Merple regarding the synthesis and effects of 5-MeO Dalt. He formatted the description in the style of a T-call entry and said that it would be included in his forthcoming book. That same day, Merple posted the 5-MeO Dalt synthesis on his personal website. One month later, it became openly available from a gray market laboratory for $200 per gram. Three months after the chemical hit the market, the first recorded 5-MeO Dalt overdose occurred when a Floridian user accidentally ingested 225 milligrams in the midst of Hurricane Jean. This was more than 11 times the maximum dose Shulgin tested. He survived the experience and shared numinous insights such as, Ozzy and the like do not mix well at all with this substance. Are you ever surprised when one of these drugs becomes very popular? Like, did you... We, for example, 5-MeO-DIPT was, was very popular around 2002. Did that surprise you? Or? No, just someone, someone made up a pile of it and, and distributed it. Yes, that, yeah. That, that I'm happy to see. Yes. Because that means other people will get involved in this area of chemistry. And then what I, my great love is, is getting new stuff out there. Yes, yes. And that, that's nice. For example, 5-MeO, uh, we go from the five M to four MEO phenethylamines to the from the methoxy to the ethoxy. You have a whole new group of compounds, all of them active, different levels of potency. Yes. You go the five MEO to the five ETO, the five ethoxy. Yes. None of the compounds have been made. But I wager everyone's gonna be interesting and active and, and worth exploring. And you you haven't experienced, you don't seem to have experienced very much long-term effect at all, any sort of damage, you seem to be in well, very I'm good still health. still alive in the <laughs> 80s here. <laughs> yeah. How many times would you estimate you used uh, MDMA? Uh, not that many. I have a tendency not to use, once I find the activity of a drug, to go on to something else. Yes. So I've, I've avoided my, pretty much my entire life repeated experiments once I know the activity. Yes. Publish it, go on to something else. Eventually Paul brought in dozens of green cardboard boxes full of chemicals. They contained a physical history of Shulkin's entire career. 
He removed the lid, revealing 100 alphanumerically indexed cells that housed glass vials with conspicuous lacunae once occupied by Schedule I drugs. The collection was supremely tantalizing and borderline pornographic. As a chemist, uh, Sasha is a collector, so um, there are a number of things in here that are, you know, the, all these things, of course, are just absolutely delightful from a, uh, an analytical standpoint because these things are extremely rare. According to the index card, the partial contents of the box Paul opened once contained trichocerine, crude curare, isomescaline, amphetamine, R-isomer DOM, MDMA, DET, DIPT, scopolamine, benzphetamine, D-isomer methamphetamine, aspirin, berberine, physostigmine, papaverine, piperidol, aconite, thebane, pilocarpine, oxycodone, oxymorphone, several forensic samples of PCP dated and labeled illicit PCP 1975, and my dear old friend, Ritalin. There's another dozen boxes upstairs for you to take with <laughs> Outside the lab, Paul was sorting through another box of boxes, which contained at least 1,000 additional vials. These are mostly chemical intermediates, a trimethoxybenzaldehyde oil, he said as he uncorked one and held a sample of black goo to his nose for a sniff. Well, that has an interesting smell. I closed one nostril and took a hard whiff. Yeah, it's, uh, what does that smell it like? smelled like Vicks vapor rub and sent a horrific pulse of nausea through my body, which was accompanied by an instantaneous pounding headache. Still, I'm glad to have allowed a few femtograms of chemical from Shulgin's collection into my bloodstream. Let's go over and have some lunch. Okay. Sounds what a very good. <laughs> Paul stayed behind while we walked back to the house, and I enjoyed a piping hot pizza with Anne, while Sasha opted for an egg salad on white bread sandwich. It was a very casual, nervous, and astonishing midsummer lunch with the greatest psychedelic chemist in the world. I sat looking at and possibly ogling Shulgin and thought about the superhuman influence his work has had on the world. The hundreds of deaths, millions of freakouts, tens of billions of dollars exchanged, of which he has not received a dime cumulative millennia of prison sentences, trillions of transformative experiences, decaliters of joy tears, decibels of laughter, and so forth. I wanted to tell him how much he's changed my life, but I wouldn't be capable of giving him enough thanks. Should we, does Sasha need some time to rest, or are we? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to pace the energy here, yes, energy yes. levels. Because we want Sasha in the lab. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well. Maybe we'll just go get some B-roll. Yeah, could we just go around and film? We are behind Alexander Shulkin's house right now, looking at his psychedelic cactus garden. All around his house, there's psychoactive plants. This is a rare variation of a T. brigisi. Uh, that is called the penis cactus. It's spineless and grows in this, uh, into this weird, smooth, psychedelic phallus. And uh, it's very rare. I've been trying to buy one for a long time. <sighs> uh, to be alone in Alexander Shulgin's lab is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually just such a powerful place where so much has happened. New drugs, new euphorians, serotonin releasers and pathogens and tactogens, charts with all these new substances that don't even have names yet. This is an incredibly rare chemical. And Shulgin had a very erotic response to it. She found it to be a potent aphrodisiac. I was hoping I could talk to her about that, but she's tired right now. She's taking a nap. Yep. It's, uh... Could hang out here all day. <laughs> if indeed this non-interview was Shulgin's last interview, I still have so many questions. Which is fair and good, a gift even. He has, after all, answered more than enough. 
Regardless, it was difficult for me to leave his lab. I wanted to hide in the trash can or climb a tree. I really didn't want this story to end. Here we are. I have just left Alexander and Ann Shulgin's house. I am completely in awe of everything that we just saw. It was too much. They showed us our, they showed me his notebooks, they showed me his collection of drugs, they uh, showed me his laboratory, they let me sniff something that made me feel sick, and uh, it was just the most incredible experience of all time, and I uh, am very glad to have had the opportunity to have a chat with him. And... Feeling good, feeling good having met my hero.